you, it's good to be here uh, in Oxford for this question. Uh, I think the title advertised was, Can We Say That We Don't Know? But maybe the question you're thinking of is, I wish they would say that they don't know. These uh, Christians who are way too confident and way too annoying about their faith. Better not to be dogmatic. No one likes a crazed fanatic. Here's a girl who's got her wits on the fence. That's where she sits, saying no one's right or wrong. Maybe, maybe. That's the chorus of the cool agnostic song. Allah, Buddha, I don't care. Who's to say what God is there? I love Man Yu, she loves Spurs. I've got my truth, she's got hers. We don't need to disagree. Maybe, baby. That's what I say to your Christianity. Um, and that isn't a real song. It's, it's a song as I imagine an agnostic might, um, might write it. I didn't want to sing a song like it with guitar, then uh, let me know it's a good tune for that. But I think agnosticism it is increasingly popular, isn't it, in our day? Because it, it sounds, well, it sounds humble. I'm not saying that I'm right, I'm not saying that you're wrong, just don't know. Uh, it sounds peaceable, we're, we're worried that if people are too sure about what they believe, then they're going to get into conflict with other people who are too sure what they believe, and there's going to be fights and wars, and we can point to some historic examples of that. So wouldn't it be better for everyone if we all just sat on the fence? That's the idea. Now, um, I'm going to talk about agnosticism. I mean, you know what the word means. Li literally, or etymologically, it just means ignorance, basically. If, if gnosticism, gnosis is about knowledge, and you negate it with the A, like if something's not typical, you say it's atypical. If something's not symmetrical, you say it's asymmetrical. Uh, if you hate bagpipes, you can describe yourself as being a-Scottish. Uh, if, if gnosticism is about knowing, then agnosticism is about not knowing. Uh, but there's different ways in which you might be agnostic. So you might be agnostic because, well, you just haven't checked. So I could say I'm agnostic about how many helium balloons it would take to uh, send my mother into orbit. And I am agnostic about that. I, um, I haven't done the experiment. It'd be quite a simple experiment, actually, wouldn't it? Just start with one and keep adding balloons until she lifts off. But my mum's kind of scared of heights, and that wouldn't be very nice. So I didn't, I didn't check. And there's all sorts of things that you don't know because you haven't researched them yet. Uh, maybe no one's researched them and it requires some pioneering science, or maybe it just requires a trip to the library to find out what's already been done. And you might be agnostic about Jesus in that sense. Like, certainly I was when I started at university um, at the other place, and I just, I just never looked into it. So my, my knowledge of Jesus came from, well, I, I was in the church choir for a while when I was young, um, and I had some RE lessons that I didn't find particularly inspirational. And that was it. I never looked into it myself. I never even so much as kind of critically read one of the first century biographies of Jesus to find out what some of the source material said. And if you're agnostic because you've never looked into it, I would really encourage you to look into it. In fact, the, the fact that Jesus was a real person in history was quite a game changer for me at university. I know this is kind of obvious. But I never clocked that. For me, Jesus was an aesthetic. You know, if you're into organ music, which I really wasn't. Um, if you like stained glass, but I quite like architecture. I like being in the, in the middle of a, a room that looks like a tsunami right now. But, um, but that was about as far as my, my sort of, in, as far as I was into the aesthetic of Christianity. Or I thought it was an ethic. You know, and I sometimes agreed with the things Jesus said and sometimes didn't. But I never realised it was history and therefore checkable. You know, if you said the Battle of Hastings was in 1166 between the British and the Congolese, you're just wrong. And I mean, you could try that as an ambitious postmodern answer in history paper, but I doubt you come out well out of the exam. Because history, well, to the extent that we can know it, either happened or it didn't happen. And I wanted to know objectively, well, who is Jesus and what did he actually do? So uh, maybe you're agnostic because you've never looked into it. Please do that. And you can do that very simply, and we can make a start with it by taking away one of these. This is an English translation of one of the biographies of Jesus, from the first century by John. It's yours to take away. Let me come look at it. There's another kind of agnosticism, though, that is more um, philosophically principled than that. And it's not just saying, I don't know. It's saying, you cannot know. It's not possible to know whether or not there is a God. But actually, when you probe it a bit more, I think it isn't actually logically coherent. Position. Uh, and it's a little bit ironic, isn't it? Because that person isn't very agnostic about their own position. Uh, 
Uh, I want to say, what makes you so dogmatic that I can't be dogmatic? Why are you so sure that we can't be sure? Uh, why aren't you more agnostic about being agnostic? Um, to say I know there is not sufficient evidence for God, it's very hard to be the negative like that, isn't it? Because it's, it's tantamount to a claim of, of complete knowledge of everything. Imagine you were to say, I know that there is no treasure hidden in Leicestershire. I mean, how could you know that? Unless you first dug everywhere. Like, what if there was a diamond necklace hidden in a detergent bottle at a postcode that the police have yet to raid? The University of Leicester Archaeological Services, who, let's face it, do more digging than most of us, didn't even know until recently that the bones of King Richard III were under their local car park. So, um, to say you know that it can't be possible to know means you bottomed out every philosophical question, you've researched every historical fact, and you haven't. So I want to say be a bit more um, humble about it and do some research. But there's another kind of agnostic. I said I don't know because I haven't checked, or why not check? I don't know because you can't know. That's a bit ridiculous, I think. But the third one is probably the most common one. I don't really want to know, actually, so leave me alone. Well, agnosticism is just the, the best defence against the ego inky member, right? <laughs> leave me alone. I don't really want to come to your lunchtime talk and it's exam time. And, you know, and, you, and you've come to humour them and say, like, thanks. But uh, really, you just want to be left alone. And the question is, what, why do you want to be? Well, I can relate to this because it was my position, I think, as, a, as an undergraduate. It was because of a fear that Christianity, if true, would be awful. I just had this sense that Jesus would suck all of the joy out of my life. And so I just didn't want it to be true. Anything I could do to avoid the question. I mean, let's face it, that is the public perception of, of Christianity, isn't it? I remember a friend of mine saying he was very surprised to read of Jesus' first miracle as recorded in this book. And, and you've probably heard that Jesus turning water into wine. He said it's very surprising to him. It wasn't the chemistry that was surprising. I mean, it's true that C, uh, H2O to C2H5OH can't be done in a laboratory. That's just in terms of ethanol. But let alone all the uh, vanillins and flavanols and anthocyanins and the complex wine chemistry. You can't do that in a laboratory. But he figured if Jesus is God, he could do that. I mean, Jesus could adjust the laws of physics and chemistry if he wanted. That wasn't the surprising thing. Rather, he was surprised that Jesus wasn't going around the world turning all the wine into water. Like, wasn't Jesus supposed to be anti-fun, anti-sex, anti-alcohol, anti-parties, anti-women, anti-gay, anti-everything? And here's Jesus showing up at a party that's not going very well, and he turns it around. I mean, you know that people don't think like this, don't you? Because when's the last time you were at an Oxford party that was, to be honest, a bit boring? And someone said, oh, it's a shame you didn't invite more Christians. Like, that, that just isn't the vibe, is it? Like, uh, a Christian party, what would that be? That would be um, a party with slur. <laughs> My friend des describes that as Christian champagne, rather than kind of. But, you know, if you could sum up the Christian ethic in a word, it would be don't. Uh, if you could choose a colour, it would be grey. Uh, that's actually not true, I think, but that's what I thought was true about Jesus. And maybe it's what you think is true about him, and that's why you just want to keep it at arm's length. Uh, and I just invite, and I guess you've come here today, so thanks, probably because you know Christian friends for whom Jesus has not sucked all the joy out of their life. And I just invite you to think of the Christians you know. Uh, and I would like to testify that Jesus actually has brought joy and meaning and fulfilment and hope um, more than anything I ever expected. Um, I can't persuade you of that just by saying so, but maybe your friend persuades you of that, at least to be brave enough to, to get a little bit closer to it. It's not going to destroy your life. Okay, three kinds of agnosticism then. I don't know because I haven't checked, or well, why not check? Uh, you can't know, says who? That's a bit silly. And I don't want to know. Well, I understand that, but can I persuade you that it, it's worth at least inching towards a little bit? What I want to do today is, um, briefly, uh, is to share a very short paragraph from the Bible, from the New Testament, by a letter that the Apostle John wrote to some other Christians. It's actually not John's Gospel, which you've got here, but John's first letter. And I want to explain why I think that agnosticism is not necessary, uh, not desirable, and not safe. And I've just got a few minutes to do that. So firstly, why it's not necessary. I'm going to read a few verses 
and then I left. I'm going to comment on what I think this is one of the most extraordinary passages in all of the And uh, tune in, see if you can find out what is so weird about it. It goes like this. That which was from the beginning, which we heard, which we have seen with our eyes, which we looked upon and touched with our hands, concerning the word of life, the life was made manifest, and we've seen it, we testified it, we proclaim to you the eternal life, which was with God the Father and was made manifest to us. That which we've seen and heard, we proclaim also to you, so that you too may have fellowship with us, and indeed our fellowship is with the Father and with his Son, Jesus Christ. And that's a paragraph in the Bible. It is a very extraordinary paragraph. And the reason it's so extraordinary is it combines two kinds of literature that in themselves are quite common, but never coincide. So the first kind of literature is, is philosophy, people philosophizing what is the meaning of life, what is the meaning of a human being, what is time, what is matter, what is being. You know, there's a lot of stuff like this, and if you really want to find people philosophizing, the best place to go is the Modern Art Gallery. I love going to Modern Art Galleries, and there's one near me called the White Cube in Bermondsey. And uh, recently I went, or a few years ago I went, and there was an exhibition of 350 um, paintings by the German artist Peter Dreyer. Every painting was 8 by 10 inches, and every one of these 350 paintings was the same empty glass of water. Now, as a piece of draftsmanship, it's quite impressive, because glasses of water are very hard to draw. You imagine the way that the, you know, the curved glass and the way the light refracts in it at different times of day. I mean, it's, it's impressive as a, as a piece of draftsmanship. Uh, it's also, you know, after a while you think, well, it's a certain discipline, isn't it? You imagine his wife saying, oh, what are you going to do today, Pete? Well, you know, I thought I might just paint that glass of water. Apparently he's painted the same glass every day for over 15 years. And this is just a few of the paintings. Um, and more fun even than the pictures. They, yeah, they were quite mesmerizing. But, and there was a, a video of him painting it. Um, and then there was, even better than that, was the, what the curator writes about it. Uh, Peter Dreyer uh, shows us that there is great fullness even in an empty glass. You think they're quite pleased with the that, aren't they? <laughs> but sort of philosophizing. This is a paragraph about that. It's about life, the, the essence of life. It's about the beginning of everything. Where do we come from? What's the origin? You, you can find that kind of question um, literature about that. The other kind of literature that you can find, it's not so sophisticated as that, but um, I call it sort of Facebook update literature. So my stepmother wrote, uh, went to the stag and lantern. Good point. Right, it's, it's, stag and lantern's a microbrewery in Hines Park. I my stepmother this. Uh, he likes craft beer. Uh, yeah, fine. He read about it in Facebook. Okay, this is normal. A billion people do this, like a day or something. Uh, log in and tell people things about their life. Philosophy and I went to the pub. They're, they're very different kinds of literature and they don't normally combine. So, when did you last hear somebody say, oh, you'll never guess you walked into the JCR? Okay. The beginning. <laughs> what? Are you, are you just trying to be weird? Like, or, um, guess who I met in hall the other day? Or who? Life. <laughs> and you wonder whether someone's been you know, eating something they shouldn't or smoking something they shouldn't when they say that. But th that's what John is saying in this letter. The beginning, which we heard and we saw with our eyes and we touched with our hands, that the life appeared, we've seen it, we heard it, we proclaim it to you. Kind of strange, right? Now, you know what he's talking about? He's talking about Jesus. This friend of his, uh, who went on boat trips with him, he spent three years of his life with him, he become knew some of friends in common with him. But he describes his mate Jesus in this extraordinary way. I met the beginning. Life. Well, I know him. I saw him. Now, this is an amazing thing to say about anybody. It's a particularly amazing thing to say about a friend of yours, right? To say, I have met God. I have met the one who is the origin of all things. I've met the one who gives everyone life. And I've been speaking for about, I'm trying to keep the time now, I've been speaking for about 10 minutes. Uh, that is 10, 15 minutes. That is already enough time for you to have worked out that I am not God. I think. Does anyone think that 
I might be divine for like a beginning day. Uh, the talk's not that good. Okay, imagine that you spent three years of your life. So I guess if you're 30, I think of someone you matriculated with. And at the end of all of those experiences with me in Oxford, you think, well, I think my friend made the universe. Uh, that, that's what's going on here. That Jesus convinced people very close to him that they had met life itself. Well, what would it take to persuade you of that? And unless you're gullible, you'd want some kind of evidence, wouldn't you? And I know we tend to be sort of very snobby about the 21st century and very patronising about the 1st century. People in the 1st century didn't know as much as we do about science. But they did know the basics. Like when you bury somebody, you don't expect to see them again. They worked that out because they just went to funerals. Or when you get out your boat, you don't walk on the surface of the water unless it's frozen. And it wasn't frozen because it was in the Middle East. You know, they, they knew enough science to know that walking on water, something weird is going on. And raising somebody from the dead all to ordinarily happen. And it, it persuades them. Of course, these were Jewish people, so they believed that there was a God, but they had God was transcendent and beyond this world. The idea that this transcendent God had come down to earth in, in flesh, they needed persuading them. But things happen that persuade them and they, they met God. And that's another reason why I want to encourage you to look at this. You know, what were the things that happened to John that persuaded him that he made, made the universe? And the great thing about this is it just, it's much more objectively checkable, isn't it, than most philosophy. The thing about meeting a person, like, I don't know, let's imagine that there's a rumour going round Oxford tomorrow that there was this bald bloke from South East London who had the dubious death sense and he spoke about agnosticism. And people say, oh no, I don't think so. I don't think that happened. No, no one would wear like yellow in Oxford. Well. <laughs> no, no, but he did. And I said, well, how sure are you about that? The answer is, you're, you're very sure, right? Because like, you're eyewitness of it. And a lot of you are eyewitness of it. And, and you know that this event at this lunchtime is it, sort of objectively certifiable by you. Because we, I'm a person and we've met in this particular encounter in life. Let alone if, if I was in Oxford for three years and I lived next door to you in halls, and you know, then you'd be really sure. That's the kind of sure that John is about Jesus. I'm sure because I met him, I'm sure because I was there. And, and when he says that uh, we saw him with our eyes and we um, touched him with our hands, I think he's talking about that most famous encounter where doubting Thomas. I'm going to call him for the purposes of today, um, agnostic Thomas. Uh, when he meets Jesus after his resurrection from the dead, and Thomas says, I, I can't believe that. I can't believe that somebody came back from death unless I were to examine the execution marks. There's a brilliant um, painting by, if you're not into Peter Dreyer, Empty Glass of Water, and you're more into Caravaggio, uh, his painting, The Incredulity of St. Thomas, is just amazing. I, I like it because a lot, Jesus sometimes in art looks a little bit uh, floaty and not quite real, <coughs> and, and he sort of smiles a bit too much. I don't like that kind of artificial Jesus, but Caravaggio Jesus I like because it's, it's very visceral <coughs> and biological. This, this picture has Jesus there with this wound, gaping wound, it's quite gory, and this old man, Thomas, like, is peering into the wound to check, were you really dead? Are you really alive? That kind of objective, and he met him, and so he's not agnostic anymore. Uh, you don't need to be agnostic if the truth is a person. You just want to meet this person. And you shouldn't want to be agnostic, I've already touched on this, but you shouldn't want, want to be agnostic, because what this person is offering is, well, let me read. Our fellowship is with God the Father, with his son Jesus Christ, and we're writing this to suck all of the joy out of your life. He doesn't say that. We're writing this to make your joy complete. Because he said, you know, meeting Jesus was the best thing that's ever happened to me. I want to share with you. And you don't need to keep it on today. And then lastly, and briefly, I've said um, agnosticism is not necessary, as you can know. Agnosticism isn't desirable because this is actually good news. And then finally, much more briefly, agnosticism is not safe. 
This is the message we've heard from him and proclaimed to you, that God is light and in him is no darkness at all. If we so we have fellowship with him while we walk in the darkness, we lie and don't practice the truth. But if we walk in the light as he's in the light, we have fellowship with one another. And the blood of Jesus, his son, cleanses us from all sin. Uh, the, the Christian message is, is a message of uh, light and darkness, of good and evil, of truth and lies. And uh, the Bible warns us that by nature we're in the darkness. We sort of mixture, aren't we? At our best, we're a mixture of light and darkness. There's something that's wrong. And if God is only light, then to draw near to him, to approach him, it's going to be dangerous. There's a problem. You can't have light and darkness in the same room. In the darkness, you turn the light and the darkness is, is destroyed. If we're partly murky and Jesus is light, only light, that, that's going to be dangerous. It's why actually people found Jesus quite uncomfortable to be around. He was good. He, he did brilliant things. He loved people, but he was uncomfortable. He said awful things. He called people out. He insisted on justice. And John says that to come into the light, it's very exposing. I used to live in a house where the, the bathroom was, um, it had no external windows, it was like in the middle of the floor comes the bathroom. So there was no light coming through the windows. And uh, we have one of those original energy saving lights, you know, the ones that you turn the light on and it's still dark and about. After about 15 minutes, the, the light bulb glows slightly and it saves you a lot of money in your electricity bill. Um, can I just say, I looked amazing in the mirror. <laughs> in that bathroom. Um, I never understood why people with morning would install like thousands of lumens of recessed lighting so that you could see their coffee yellows teeth. Um, I, I look good in, in uh, three lumens. But when you come close up to Jesus, we all look a bit grubby. And he says, well, that's okay. Because the blood of Jesus cleanses us from all our sin. Here's a message, in other words, about a God who's knowable, but a gulf that needs to be bridged. And Jesus can bridge it. Um, a disease that needs to be healed, and, and Jesus can heal it. Um, a, a crisis coming, light meets darkness, but Jesus can avert it. And the thing about that kind of message is you can't really safely be neutral about it. Uh, let's imagine I told you um, that we have cancer. One of my family members recently discovered she has breast cancer. But it's okay because we caught it early and the chemo is probably going to be fine, so you need to stop um, chemotherapy uh, immediately. And you think, well, yeah, but I'm not sure whether to trust that doctor because you know, they've got a vested interest in these diagnoses. I think I feel okay. So you go and ask a friend for another opinion and say, oh, I think you, you look fine. So you've got somebody who says you've got cancer and you need treatment, somebody else who says you're fine, and what does the agnostic do? Well, there's not a middle of the road, is there? You, you either ignore the doctor, or you follow the advice of the doctor, but you can't do neither. There's not a neutral. And it's like that with Jesus. He says that there's a problem, well, I can fix the problem. There's a crisis coming, well, I can avert the crisis. And you can either say, yes, please, Jesus, I, I want that solution, or you can say, no, thank you, Jesus, I reject it. But you can't. There's not a middle option. So agnosticism is not necessary because we can know. It's not desirable because it's good news. And it's not safe. 